All right, let's get started. So I am Brian Cardell, and I am a developer advocate at Egalia, and I am affiliated with the OpenJS Foundation and W3C, but you'll learn more about this as we go. I want to get started and say that I think that the web is amazing. I think that doesn't require proof of citation or anything. I think it's self-evident. And yet, at the same time, it's really hard to be a developer for the web and not think we can do better. <clears throat> So that leads me to this question, which is, do you think that we'll still be talking about the web at big conferences like this in 2049? That's 30 years from today. That's a really long time. There's definitely people in this room whose entire lives have fit into a span less than that. And you know from your own life that technology changes really, really quickly. So it feels really, really hard to imagine 30 years from now, we'll still be caring about this. But this is relevant because on this timeline, this is where we are. The web is 30. So happy birthday to the web. That's great. But also, while that's amazing, it's a little bit depressing. Like, does it get any better than this? And I would like to convince you in this talk that it very much is getting better. And I'm going to tell you about this in terms of eras and why I think that's the case. I think that these are the eras and that the second half was better than the first half. And the second half of that was better than the first half of that. And the second half of that was even better than the, than the first half of that. In other words, it's getting better faster. And I think that this all has to do a lot. I'm going to try to convince you that uh, it is about correcting our assumptions and the inertia of things established very early on in the web that are related to our ideas about the future and standardization, competition and licensing. In the end, it's going to be all right. That's the message. So let's dig in and talk about the first half. If we could uh, hop in our DeLorean and go back in time to May 1989, the web was born into chaos. We have no idea what we're doing. And I don't mean with the web. I mean, at large, uh, computers, hardware, software, the internet, standardization. We have some experience with all of this stuff, but it's very new and limited. And all of this stuff seems kind of unlike the things that came before it. And we're just not really sure how to deal with it. So that's the world that the web was born into. When we say born in 30 years ago, what happened is this is Tim Berners-Lee proposal for the web. Uh, it was eight pages and uh, it's fun to think about what it was because uh, it wasn't the internet. That was Vince Cerf. That was decades earlier. It wasn't hypertext. That was this guy, Ted Nelson, also way, way earlier. Uh, it wasn't programs that made hypertext a reality. Those were prevalent and popular at the time. It wasn't documents marked up with tags like HTML. That was Charles Goldfarb that invented that, again, decades earlier. It wasn't even things that put lots of those things together. This is fun. This is Ian Ritchie, uh, and he had a company called uh, Owl Software, and they had a product called Guide. Uh, this is Owl's Guide, and uh, it did all of those things. Uh, it encoded them in, it encoded its documents in SGML markup uh, and that flavor he even called those documents hypertext markup language if you can believe it so that sounds really an awfully lot like a browser tim berners lee thought so too in fact this is him talking to ian ritchie trying to get ian ritchie to make the browser he said look you have a browser like there are browsers already they just imagine though imagine the one critical missing piece is that all of these things are universally addressable and referenceable. Imagine what would change if we did that. And pretty much everybody that Tim approached said, no, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't imagine it. But this is interesting, and I have this little jut out from the timeline here, because I, I wonder what would happen uh, if we had gone down that path. I expect kind of it probably wouldn't be good, because... All of software at that point was shrink, shrink wrap product. Like you, you would go to the store or, or order it as physical media. You would buy it. You would buy a license to it. So we didn't go that way. And uh, this means that Tim decided he had to build it himself, at least enough to convince other people. 
So this leads to a shrewd move in on Tim's part in the history that is going to be important. And that is that Tim's pitch for how to get this started was a little bit like the Seinfeld pitch. It was nothing or maybe not nothing, but as little as possible. In Tim's mind, web content already existed. Uh, this is probably really, really hard to imagine. Uh, and it's really hard to imagine because the only thing that Tim really cared about was this. Now you can say, yeah, but you don't get that without HTML, right? And well, yes and no. He said, you know, that HTML thing, it kind of already exists. Um, so uh, SGML was very popular. And if you looked around CERN, there was thousands and thousands and thousands of documents in SGML. And because of their history, they all shared a common core and just one of those systems, CERNDoc, had tens of thousands of documents like this. And if you were to look at this document, you can see it contains headings and paragraphs and titles. Uh, and in Tim's mind, he thought you would just go and create these HTML documents that just you make your notes and you would just link them to these things. And so Tim set out and he created the first web browser and he thought, well, you know, it just has to display those things that I understand and ignore those elements that I don't show them, but don't do anything special with them. So Tim made the first browser and it was read, write. It was a graphical browser, pretty nice. But there's another bit that comes out of this that is important to the future, which is that Tim didn't actually know SGML. He didn't like, he wasn't experienced with this. He was sort of reverse engineering. Oh, I get the angle braces and things. And so Tim's parser had different qualities. It was very forgiving, for example. So is that a happy accident or a grave misfortune? At this point, it would depend on who you ask. But the result is Tim was able to show some things and get people excited. And for a while, people were creating browsers, lots of them. There were like 22, 23 browsers. And th these were all created by hackers. They were for the commons. They were free software. And all these people, they wanted more from HTML because like, why not, right? It, it, this is what HTML looked like at the time, more or less. This is what you had. Uh, this is really terrible and weak. But when I say that people wanted more, I mean, they wanted a lot more and they put more in their browsers. So this is Viola. Uh, I think this is 1992. It was created by a guy named Pei Wei. And he was a student who had made a virtual machine and he thought this is a great excuse to show off my virtual machine. And he made his virtual machine a, a browser for his virtual machine. And his browser was capable of showing inline images and tables and style sheets and frames and even embedding other things for his virtual machine, e applets. Um, so that's amazing. It's way more than anybody had. Um, I point this out because it's really hard to overstate the importance of this. We'll see these ripple effects throughout the history of the web based on that last thing. And the first thing is that uh, somebody got a hold of Payway's browser, thought it was really, really interesting. And he worked at NCSA and he took it to uh, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, who worked there at the time. And he said, let me show you this thing. And the result is that Mosaic was born. Uh, this inspired the creation of Mosaic. So the interesting thing about Mosaic is not just that it was the first sort of winner of the web. The very early web was won by Mosaic. Uh, but also that it was still in this mindset of like that the web browser could be some shrink wrapped pro product. It was actually a product. It had very generous terms, at least to get you hooked, uh, but it was still proprietary. The web, on the other hand, had this struggle very early on, and Tim convinced CERN to put this in the public domain. This is for everyone. This is the famous thing from the Olympics celebrating that this is for everyone, and that's what this is about. Um, this is probably one of the things that made the web the successful thing that it was. Uh, but when we say successful, let's put it in perspective what that means. So uh, by this period of time in 1994, 1 1.9 million households have internet access. 
That's internet access. That isn't the web. Only a tiny fraction of those people were using the web because there were a lot of competitors for the web. Most of them were proprietary. So the qualities of this web at the time, it was really, really slow. Uh, almost everybody who has had a connection was operating on dial-up, very slow dial-up. But the interesting thing is that web browsers had this view source from the very early days. They had this view source. And it was not that complicated. You could sort of sit and figure it out without very much training, which is great because then you could create something. And oh my God, when you created something, I know this seems really, really silly today, but at the time this was like creating fire. You would send a link to somebody across the world and they could see this thing that you made. That was amazing. We're going to just kind of whip through these couple of years here. We're not going to focus on any of them other than to say that the next few years were a blur of all kinds of activity. And there's all these different things being pushed and pulled, trying different things. Internet Explorer enters the game and starts getting kind of popular. And at some point, Tim Berners-Lee says, look, everybody is supporting different things. The web is at risk of dramatic fracturing. We should probably standardize something or else the web isn't going to last. And this was uncontroversial. Everybody agreed. Like, obviously, it's self-evident that you need to do that. But how do you do that exactly? And like I said, we don't know. Um, this is an interesting problem. Uh, I don't know if you ever sat and thought about, like, why are there so many standards bodies? And the reason that there are so many standards bodies is largely because... At some point, somebody becomes disillusioned enough with them to go somewhere else and try something else. And uh, they all work differently. Also, none of them are static. In other words, they learn from each other. They change and adapt trying to do better. Okay, so on to 1995. Uh, Sun Microsystems creates Java. Now, I drew this little picture, and that picture should look familiar because it is also Pei Wei's answer. Java is huge news. It is really, really massive. It is like there is the web, and then there is this new virtual machine thing. Now, you probably, if you look at a lot of things that you read, you would probably imagine that Tim Berners-Lee, like, standing like Gandalf at the gates, saying, no, this is not, like, the web is so much more better than this. This is abysmal. But actually, Tim was like, that sounds really good, actually. I He endorsed it a lot, and he endorsed Payways Browser as well. The reason being, at least, you know, for real applications, not for documents, but for applications, because, you know, HTML for applications is like, it feels gross, right? <laughs> like, don't we need something else? Especially when this was HTML, right? I mean, this is, this is nothing. This is really hard to do something with. And so many, many real designers and engineers, they just laughed at this. Like, you, you can't possibly do anything with this because rightly they should, because this was the state of the art at the time. This was the user experience. You know, it worked offline. In fact, online was the special case. It was written with like these robust programming languages, which are modern and efficient and had all of these abstractions with windowing toolkits. And, you know, we had paragraphs and links and we built like Hotmail and Hotmail had none of that. It was markedly worse on almost every metric, except it had this one characteristic that was you could get to it from anywhere. It had zero install. You could just access it, and ultimately that was more important, which is, like, mind-boggling, actually, but it's true. Let's whip forward to 97, 98. Eight or nine years in, there's something else pivotal that happens. This is where we get the creation of the W3C and the move to standardized JavaScript at ECMA. I like to think of this as sort of the golden era of standards, because we get the first JS specification, the first HTML4. So HTML4 is a little bit of a misnomer because it's like really one of the first standards that like actually was. But we get CSS2. CSS1 is also mostly a joke. And we get the 4.0 browsers, which are the first browsers that have like some level of interoperability and standards compliance. So we have this early success. 
And uh, none of the people who were the hackers who were doing the web, they didn't know anything about standards. So we just imagined, yes, please, you had me at hello. We'll take anything that you're going to give us is clearly very good. You know, we imagined it like this school of Athens of like the smartest people would get together and just give us the answers. So we were, you know, hook, line and sinker on anything that they would have given us. And one of the first the two first things that they gave us really were XML and the DOM. And we thought those were really, really exciting, actually. Um, basic XML and the DOM were really, really popular ideas. But then that led to we need to fix this because like HTML is actually not very good. And some of the things that preceded it had some better qualities. Those people wanted to be involved. They wanted to correct those problems. Lots of ideas were floating around. And so in 1998, the W3C said, uh, HTML, at least as you know it, is dead. And the future is coming and it will be XML based. It's going to be, everything is going to be XML. Oh, and another thing that happened. Nine years in, we got the return of some legit open source free software browsers. KHTML was free software. It was part of the KDE desktop. And uh, Mozilla was created from Netscape. So when Netscape was created, it was a for-profit company. Again, a proprietary. And it was created by Mark Andreessen, was one of the creators. He was also, as we said, involved in creating Mosaic and Netscape wanted to own the internet. Like they wanted to own the web. And that was the idea. They were going to make this product that was going to replace Mosaic project. So internally, this had a code name, Mozilla, Mosaic Killer. IE was really eating their lunch by that point. And as a last ditch effort, Netscape was open sourced. It began this, re this rewrite that was open sourced. Note that this is where we get the term open source and the, the current basic model that we have. Before that, that wasn't a thing. Okay, so let's take us all the way to 2001. Uh, Internet Explorer made Internet Explorer 6. It was a very, very good browser actually at the time. I know that's probably hard to believe in retrospect, but it was actually the best browser. It was very, very good. And uh, they managed to accumulate like over 90% some would say over 95% looks at depends on what you're looking at percent of the market. And because, you know, this web was done, they disbanded the team. So they say goodbye to the Internet Explorer team and hello to the Silverlight team. This was going to be Microsoft's answer to the future of the web. Because, you know, HTML for applications is gross. Like we need something better and it was something better and it was just like the other something better is it looked very, very similar. Uh, so, you know, it was made for real applications and it had a real UI toolkit and all these qualities that you would like. But meanwhile, developers, the people who are making the web, they weren't having any of that. They were trying to extend the web to make it do the things that they wanted to do. Which takes us to 2004. 2004 is the halfway point. So in this half, we have all of these projects spring up, all of these open source libraries and things in JavaScript, trying to patch the web, make the web more easy to program for, do interesting things. They're seeing one another's ideas. They're one-upping one another. They're trading, they're cross-pollinating. All these interesting things are happening. This leads to web 2.0, the web as a platform, which is coined. It's a marketing term, <laughs> it means nothing but it becomes the sort of rallying cry selling point that gives the web its next big boost. Uh, meanwhile, in web standards land, uh, W3C is pumping out specification after specification after specification based on XML. They're very, very complicated. Developers are trying to follow this because we're very sold, but it is confusing and complicated. And many of these ideas that are pushed through as a standard, we are rejecting in favor of something that isn't a standard. So we take the things for SOAP and WSDLs and Beppel and XSD and we say, nah, rest is good enough. One day Doug Crockford comes along and says, hey, I don't know, what about this? And it has the same kind of benefits that Tim Berners-Lee's 
had, which is like, eh, it kind of already exists. We have browsers. Browsers know how to read JavaScript. JavaScript has objects. It thinks about things in the way that C family languages think about things. And that is what developers choose. Like we advocate, we leave the standard behind and choose this thing made by just a random guy. <laughs> What happened to this school of Athens? Like this glory of the smartest people coming up with the answers. They have built their entire building on this idea of XML. And we just came along and knocked the whole thing down. So by June of 2004, everyone is like, what now? I mean, like the W3C, weren't they working on web 2.0? And now it's arrived and it's not that in even remotely. <laughs> what happens to all of this work? And so a workshop is called at the W3C among members to discuss what to do with applications in general, because things are being torn apart. There are lots of position papers that are submitted. One is submitted by Ian Hickson, who most people call Hixie, who worked at Opera at the time. And uh, his position said, like, look, uh, you can look at the web and you can look at like the reality of the web. And the reality is that developers doing all these great things. Well, a lot of this other stuff that you have is theoretical and it's not ready. The situation they have right now is terrible and we can surely do better. And the web isn't good for all applications, at least some applications it would appear to be good for. So let's rev HTML. W3C votes, no. This leads to the creation of the what working group. That's Opera, Mozilla, and Apple. They get together and they're going to rev HTML. But there's all kinds of complexities here. For one, the HTML specification is copyright W3C. But regardless, Pixie sets to work in the fires of Norway and he is crafting the, the specification. But remember to a lot of us looking at this from the outside, uh, this seemed like very Don Quixote at some level because Microsoft is not on board. They have no browser team. They have a competitor for the next web. In fact, there are several competitors for the next web already. And they control like upwards of 90%. And the remaining 10% is really fractured. This is how we advance the web is Apple comes in, they fork KHTML and they create WebKit. So with WebKit, we now have two engines that are built on open source and with some kind of backing, like somebody is backing them monetarily. Then one day on Hixie's blog, he mentions that he is leaving Opera and going to work at Google where he will continue his work on HTML. Uh, this leads a lot of people to question, is Google building a browser? Because they are contributing an awful lot to WebKit at the time. Google says, no, no, they're not building a browser. In developer space, we are continuing to rapidly experiment where things are failing, succeeding a little bit more, succeeding a little bit less, trading ideas, and jQuery comes along. And suddenly when everybody sees it, they say, that's the thing. And very quickly, jQuery becomes sort of the de facto standard of the web. We get the first output from the what working group, and it is not a rich new component with like something that you think of when you think of HTML5. It is the first draft of the HTML parser specification. Just think about this for a minute. Look at where we are on this timeline. The parser, the HTML parser is not specified until right here. How is that possible? <laughs> like that is a huge reality check. Up until this point, which browser you viewed something in, would expose a DOM and that DOM could be differently shaped and how you operated on that DOM could be differently shaped in all the different browsers. Uh, this was a huge source of pain for developers and also for browser manufacturers. So step one was specify the parser. This would be a lot easier, of course, if there were tests, but there were no consolidated tests somewhere for any of this. Uh, amazing, right? So we specify the parser and like to give you an idea what a change this was, how big a revolution having a specified parser would be. 
Here's what Opera would end up calling their new parser, Ragnarok. This is way before the movie, and it has to do with the fact that it was created where it was. But this is amazing, right? I mean, that's such a big name. Uh, and they were right. And, and so things began to move on a little bit. It started to get a little bit more serious. And in 2007, W3C suddenly becomes convinced, okay, let's do HTML5. You know, for medium-sized applications, at least. We're not giving up on our dreams just yet. But it seems like you've done a lot of hard work. Let's go ahead and do HTML5. I bring the team back, but they are now way behind. So we get IE7, and it is, you know, really good. This leads us to 2007, where we get the introduction of the iPhone, uh, which is all kinds of new, interesting things. And among them is that it has a web browser. September 2008, surprise, Google is building a browser. Google is building a browser, but they're doing it by forking WebKit, which was forked from KHTML. And they're doing it really because they wanted a faster JavaScript engine. So when we talk about a browser, this is an interesting way to think about it. In the middle slice, you have the browser engine. Inside of that has a JavaScript script engine. And then on top of that, and at the bottom of that, you have to slap in the OS level implementations and the Chrome, the browser around it, and the wiring down into it. So what Google did was they took out what was JavaScript core and they replaced it with their new engine called V8. It's spec compliant, but surprise, things break. It's happened a number of times where if you implement what the spec says exactly, sites will break. As it turns out, this taking these and polishing down the rough edges and finding the interoperability, making everything work the same, is one of those things that standards are really good at managing. Okay, so here's where we are at in this time. So we have these uh, open engines, Apple, Google, and Mozilla. And then we have these proprietary engines, Opera and Microsoft. These ones are doing HTML5. What is this Adobe one doing? Uh, this is Adobe Air, which is, you know, for real applications. It looked just like the other ones. The architecture was just like the other ones. Finally, 20 years in, we finally decide this web, the one with HTML, is in fact not dead. Uh, so we are going to move forward with that web. Which leads us to Harmony. Now we begin getting into the sort of harmonious era. So let's get to the last 10 years. Web developers, they never stopped. They're competing, adapting, connecting, and improving things in open source. They are doing mind-blowingly awesome things to take the web forward. In May 2009, Ryan Dahl takes the V8 engine out of the browser project and creates Node. And the world says, yep, that's the thing. And we all jump on board that. So even still here at this period in time, advancement is really held back. And it's held back by the fact that the economics don't look great still because Internet Explorer is this anchor. It's not moving forward fast enough. There might be all this great stuff in WebKit and Chromium and Firefox, but collectively they actually don't control enough market share for developers to be exploring it and building sites for it. So there is not a clear way to get there. This is very difficult to unwind chicken and egg problem. So developers, again, are the solution to this. Uh, Remy Sharp coins the term polyfill. We have these efforts to sort of polyfill and make Internet Explorer or whatever browser work well enough that we can begin to explore HTML5. Another thing that happened is that those libraries that were that were advancing the web, uh, they began to want to have some say in the standards process. And so uh, they're not the only one, but the jQuery standards team, we began working on standards. So February 13th, 2013 is another interesting thing and a surprise move. Opera browser decided that it's going to give up its rendering engine and it's going to switch to the open source WebKit engine. This is also the period where we begin web platform tests. We begin working together collectively on tests. I would like you to look at where that bullet is. 
so we get to April 2013, which is just barely after uh, Opera made their announcement. And Google says, uh, nope, we're going to fork WebKit and create the Blink rendering engine. So it's no longer that we're going to just create our own version of WebKit that has a different JavaScript engine. We're going to actually f fork the project and create our own rendering engine as well. Basically, immediately, Opera says, nope, yeah, we're, we're going to do that too. We're... We're going to use Blink, forget WebKit. Outside of browsers, though, privately, a lot of people, developers, began talking. And a lot of us began to find common ground and some frustrations. And we began to ask each other, like, does this seem really broken to you? And yes, is the answer. Yes, a lot of it seems very broken, dysfunctional. And it seems like a lot of the problems are more about how we got here. It seems like we're not really great at prognosticating the future of the web. That a room, a tiny room full of people can't do that. Ultimately, there needs to be like selection pressure, and to do that, we need like these DNA level things that we can prove in the wild. So everybody agreed with that. In other words, basically, the idea is that the economics of web standards are incomplete. We could do better. So we began to think that maybe we could fix this and we reached out and we talked to a bunch of people and by the middle of 2013, we published the extensive web manifesto. Basically the ideas are that we have a lot of greatness buried in the web platform already, but the way we do this is not great and we could do better. We should work for a little while on prioritizing and explaining the existing uh, architecture and APIs and do this in a way that gives developers power to plug into and extend these and create new powers and experiment and dream new dreams. The developers are actually really important, critical to the process. We are the ones that have to pick the answer at the end of the day. And let's try to find a standardization model that actually works more like this. Uh, so at this point, we have the first extensible web summit people from actually standards bodies and different browser vendors and regular developers and framework makers from all over the world. We get together to talk about these problems. TPAC is a big annual event of W3C. All of the members come and talk together and do a lot of work. And there are presentations, there's open forum and everything. And in this uh, particular TPAC, I worked with uh, Marcos Caceres and Robin Berjan to present this how we move forward from here, uh, how you imagine the world after HTML5. Uh, and it was quite an ask, actually. And I expected an, an incredible amount of pushback and disinterest, uh, but it wasn't anything but that, actually. Um, some of the people that I assumed would be most against it were actually some of our biggest advocates, Microsoft, for example. This basically is uh, like trying to move the Titanic, though. I mean, this is this is a change to, you know, everything uh, It is a really big idea. And I would like to show you where it occurs on this timeline. Since then, we have done all these things. And one of the things that I pushed for was that uh, this has to apply to CSS. CSS is the single most magical piece that we have. Uh, there is no mechanism for extensibility. There is no means for you to plug in and like provide your own layout or just tweak something. And internally, it is so phenomenally complicated that, I mean, it takes millions of dollars and years to rewrite engines. So if you wanted to approximate something, you cannot do a good job. People at first told me uh, this, basically, not with 10,000 men could you do that. Um, it is totally impossible. And yet, we got Houdini very shortly thereafter, which is an effort that is aimed exactly toward that. It is aimed toward explaining the magic in the web platform under CSS and providing the escape hatches and hooks for you to work on it. In the next couple of years, uh, the first meeting for Houdini was in 2015. And I mean... <laughs> All of the people from all of the vendors really came to play. Like it was amazing uh, the amount of support that we got. It was incredible. This is the Houdini task force and uh, it is moving the web in that direction so that we can try out 
Uh, we can let developers explore uh, how to do these new features. We can provide polyfills for CSS and we can, you know, test a thing before we try to write it down and see if developers actually use it. So also in this same time, all of these things that were magic in the platform have been explained and added so much better. So from underneath everything, we got fetch, which required uh, request, response, streams, promises, URLs, cache. Like we got the accessibility object model that's developing. We got the shadow DOM, focus visible, inert, like all of these, this huge long list of things. This is not even nearly complete. All of these things happen in this tiny little fraction of time. We came to the conclusion together, collectively as a standards body, that experiments have to be clear that they're experiments. We need new ways to work on them. We need ways for developers to help seek consensus. And we need this championship model and different like new ways to think about and manage the IP requirements of standards. Uh, so we have all these levels. We have this discourse that you can currently go and that's open to anyone. Uh, we have trying to find better ways for you to manage your time to be involved in particular topics without having to be involved with everything. Uh, you can graduate from there into an official incubation, which is considerably more serious, but it's not a standard. It's not necessarily on a standards track. We'll have to see. It could change a lot. We have a similar model now in TC39, which is the stages model. So all of this is much, much more clear for developers. We also got W3C has a group called the Technical Architecture Group. is a small group it's chaired by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, their goal is to think about the web for 100 years in the future. How do we make it last? And I'm very pleased that one of their findings is called Polyfills and the Evolution of the Web, which is uh, very inspired on the Extensible Web Manifesto ideas, how we get developers involved and we use developers input to help shape the future of the web, test it. So this little uh, shape here is the area that we've been talking about for the last many, many minutes. And so much has happened. There's so much amazing progress. But uh, meanwhile, this other thing happened. In 2007, 2017, suddenly CSS grid seemed to land everywhere. That was amazing, right? So what's really interesting about this is that this is the spec and it was created in 2011. So we we're talking about 2017, right? But it was stuck. And if actually, if that feels like a long time to you, that is not a long time because that's just when we got this particular brand of the spec. It's not the first time we ever tried that. Um, the first time we tried wasn't even the time we tried in 2005. It was 1996. 1996 is the first time some of the ideas for making grid-like things was proposed in the CSS working group. And you know, we have, it has been impossible to advance. So what happened? What happened is that we, we made everything open. We'll come back to that though. By the end of 2018, everything is so much better. Beauty is everywhere. Our commons is rich and deep and multi-layered. Our content, our open data, it's amazing. We have these new ideas being thrown out about a contract for the web. Everywhere you look, everything is the web. Google Docs or Office 360. We have uh, like videos and online education and training. There's pretty much nowhere you can go that the web isn't. We have these great things like the OpenJS Foundation. There's a foundation to help manage open source for JavaScript projects. And importantly, all of the implementations of standards are now in open projects. We have Node. We have not just new browsers. We have whole new ideas like Brave and the Beaker browser, which are looking at you know how we manage a distributed web and a, and a privacy-based web and new advertising and funding models. Even the things that aren't in a web browser are ultimately usually using a rendering engine. Slack, if you use it, if you use like editor like Ghost or VS Code, uh, all these things are using a web rendering engine to do their work. It's on our cell phones. In fact, most of the apps that you're running are just hosting a web view. They're everywhere on embedded, and I mean everywhere. The car infotainment systems, signs, point of sale, digital signage. Turn on your TV, turn on your Roku, turn on anything. Almost all of those are using a web rendering engine. Your PS4 is using a web rendering engine. 
So we all move forward together. We centralize this investment and we all move forward together as a commons. That's amazing. So we have lots of common interests, lots more contributions, increased involvement and increasing ways to be involved at so many different levels. Things are gotten so much better. The same basic tech standards, skills and code are increasingly useful everywhere. In other words, what I'm trying to explain to you is that standards are really starting to click and yet they could be better. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. They can be better. We're, we're just making progress. Uh, it's a very hard sh ship to steer, but uh, we can do it. One of the things we can do looking forward from 2019 is to focus on this part of the extensible web manifesto that we want developers to write more declarative code, not less. A lot of people focus on just the low level primitives idea of the extensible web manifesto, but this is actually really important. We have to build up to higher layers. Uh, so there are some really interesting things about thinking about how we move forward. Open UI is an example. One of the things that happened like not long ago is um, Google tried to articulate uh, possible futures and connect all of the dots. This is a thing that nobody had done before. Uh, this went really wrong for them in a lot of ways, primarily, I think, because it was confusing to developers who didn't understand what they were, what was happening here. And they reacted to the names of the elements or the choice of the elements or something when that is not the idea at all. But at the end of the day, the idea that we all agree to is that we need to use science. Uh, we need to find ways to explore what ideas are getting uptake in a way that is very, very portable toward just standardizing basically exactly what has been proven. Uh, we need to do more collaboration and outreach. Uh, I do that with my coworker, uh, Dan Erberg from Egalia. Uh, we run these JS outreach groups and we, re we meet regularly with educators. We have another group that meets regularly with uh, tools and library uh, sorry, tool makers and uh, another one that meets with like frameworks uh, and libraries. So uh, that's all happening. It's all public. All the minutes are public and everything. We're getting more voices, trying to coalesce information, make it more efficient. So one of the things that comes up though is like, sure, but what about the politics, right? Because in, don't the politics really hold us back? Like, why does browser X think that feature Y is more important than feature Z? Like, why can we not just get them to move it along, right? So we like to think about from the outside, this process is being like this nice, smooth conveyor belt and somebody is just gumming up the process. But here's the thing that we just doesn't get talked about enough which is that a lot isn't stuck over silly politics. That's a weird illusion they're stuck because of organizational problems and priorities that are created by the fact that most of the investment in the commons is coming from browser vendors and browser vendors, uh, they have departments and they have budgets and they have managers and they have people with special skills and they have this problem where everything is constantly cut, like nothing ever slows down. So there's never fewer things to prioritize. There's always more things to prioritize. No matter how big a budget anybody creates, it is in the end of the day finite. It is actually a considerable amount of money, I can tell you, what it takes to maintain a, a web browser, far more than you would imagine probably. And the trouble is that it's only really a standard if everybody makes it through the this massive series of gauntlets of standardization, getting the interest in time investment to standardize a thing and then getting in every single business the prioritization investment to actually do the implementation and the testing and then the maintenance and everything. This is a feedback loop and it means that the pipeline gets jammed up. The more things go in it, the harder this problem gets. So imagine if we could fix this problem. I think this is the next big problem for web standards. And that's why I came to work for Regalia. Egalia loves the commons. That's what we're all about. So we are a collective of developers in countries all over the world, and we work on all of the web engines and web technologies. So we work on all of the JavaScript engines. We work on all of the rendering engines. We're a part of all of the relevant standards groups. 
CSS grid. Remember that? Uh, we did that. We did resize observer and responsive image preloading and web packaging and lots of things. MathML and Chromium. So I don't know what people know about the history of MathML, but math was obviously a need. I mean, the web was created at CERN. Like, obviously, you need math. And so uh, some of the proposals early on in the early 90s included some facet for rendering mathematics because math is text. This got standardized at W3C and it got implemented everywhere except for Chromium. And uh, Google had taken a look at this and they said like, it's just too hard. It's too, it's too much investment that it requires to solve all of the problems, to live up to what we think the standard should be for this. And so we will not prioritize it. So Egalia helped get that done and it is currently upstreaming in Chromium right now, which is really, really exciting. So I think, yes, indeed, we will be talking about the web 30 years in the future, and you can go ahead and RSVP now.